Hey guys, it's Edward. So today I'm gonna to talk about the behavioral interview. Now, this portion of the interview is the forgotten child of the interview family. The one people don't really notice, but then remember the day before that it exists. But this interview can actually make or break whether or not you get a high or low offer. And in some cases, it can even up-level you from a mid-level to a senior engineer. In fact, I was able to get an up-leveled offer myself at Uber, and I have replicated this success in my clients, even up to the staff level. And having been on both sides of the table as both the interviewer and the interviewee at both Apple and Uber at the senior level, I can tell you the best way to conduct yourself for the behavioral interview, as well as the common mistakes to avoid. So today, I'll talk about what we look for in the behavioral interview and how you can use that to your advantage to appear to be a better candidate. If you do this correctly, you can convince even the most seasoned engineers that you should be ranked higher than you actually are. So welcome to the coding interview, you suck. Let's first answer three questions. What exactly is a behavioral interview? What is its purpose? And how do we judge a candidate? Firstly, the behavioral interview is simply a interview about how you conduct yourself as a developer in a professional environment, what you value, and how that leads to your everyday responsibilities in your career. Now, that seems simple enough, but why do so many people get this wrong? On the surface, it's just a show up and be yourself and don't be a jerk interview. But that's where the oversimplification actually falls short. It's not a personal interview, it's a professional one. We aren't looking for a candidate who necessarily fits the quote unquote lifestyle of the company or has a certain personality. In that regard, the label of behavioral interview tends to actually be a misnomer. Most people think that you have to deal with conflict in a certain way and present yourself in a particular manner that makes you seem more magnanimous than you actually are. That's completely wrong. You can solve conflicts in a multitude of different ways. There are many ways to solve conflicts and conflicts occur no matter what level you're at, whether you're a junior engineer or a senior engineer, and everyone has their own way of actually building a cord with one another. Like I said at the very beginning, it's about the everyday responsibilities in your career. Undertaking any kind of project will cause conflict and that's an inevitability. The real way we judge you is what kind of tasks you are taking on and how you conduct or behave yourself during your job. That is also why we throw questions like, describe a time when you had a conflict with a teammate or describe a failure that you had. All these are inevitabilities of any level or scope of a project and we want to see how you respond to these difficulties and the problems that trigger these events. After all, if you talk about topics and project scopes like a senior engineer and perform the tasks of a senior engineer, then you should behave like a senior engineer, correct? And most importantly, be recognized as a senior engineer by your peers or of people of similar level. This is why we conduct the behavioral interview. We want to see how much responsibility we can give you and whether your conduct day to day is befitting of that. And in order to do that, we need to dive into your day-to-day -day actions and behaviors. So let's answer the second part of that question. The purpose of the behavioral interview is to give you as much responsibility as you can handle. And with that comes the title. We call this leveling, which leads us to the natural question of how we can even judge or quote unquote level a candidate. What are the criteria? How do we judge a candidate for the right skill level? What is the judging process that companies use? And how can we use the questions that we ask a candidate to determine their engineering level? Often, companies will use internal rubrics to judge a candidate. They note the candidate's performance for the technical and behavioral interview and matching them up against what the company's leveling is. You can see an example here. This is the Square Engineering rubric, and I'll link it in the comments. It's very basic, but it's pretty much the bare bones of what you'd expect at any engineering company. In the rubric, the coding expectations and the scope of impact tends to grow larger the higher level you go up. That's generally the trend, but you can basically think of a junior engineer as fixing bugs, a mid-level engineer as working on self-contained projects, a senior engineer leading a small team, and a staff engineer leading multiple teams. Now that we know that we're mostly looking at responsibilities a candidate talks about, let's actually talk about strategy, or rather, how we can game the behavioral interview to actually perform well on it. 
because on the surface, the path forward is obvious. Show you do the work expected of a candidate at X level and get an offer for X level. But there's actually a few caveats to this. For one, the rubric tends to be a little vague and you can see here that in the Square Engineering Ladder that statements like implements code that is clear, concise, tested, and easily understood is something that would seem to apply to anyone, not just an L3 engineer. Why are some attributes in one category but not the other? And why do some attributes seem to span a bunch of different levels? Furthermore, it's easy to give wrong signals. If you want to try talking as if you're a senior engineer and you spend all your time talking about how you map some factory or facade pattern in the code to your contribution, then that sounds more like L3 level work because that's digging into the details. And this is despite the fact that even L5 senior level engineers are expected to code. So how can we present ourselves at the right level without being mistaken for another level? The answer boils down to what you value in a project and your job and what you value will determine how much scope and responsibility you can handle because valuing and focusing on the right things in engineering will increase the likelihood of success in certain size projects. Now, let me go on a little bit of a tangent and this will make sense in a little bit. Software engineering is hard and I mean really hard. You are combining a bunch of heuristics and rules that are not systematically ordered to try and create a system that millions of people rely on. We are essentially cobbling together using past patterns and experiences that we've encountered and that we think will work based off our feeling and gut. If we built bridges the exact same off the cuff way that we build software, we would all be immediately fired for incompetence. To manage all this properly, you need to understand what your job entails as the scope of your responsibilities change and how multiple different factors affect your code. This can be on the macro level, like the trends of the open source ecosystem and upper management stonewalling you to the nitty gritty details of what code patterns to use. All these are going to affect how you go about your project and the more experienced you are, the larger macro trends you can handle and what you prioritize and what experiences you talk about will reveal what factors you value and can handle. Let's take a hypothetical example. How can valuing the right things lead to a project success? And what happens if we do the wrong things? Suppose I ask a junior and senior engineer about a project that they did and suppose both of them talked about developing a music application. The junior engineer would talk about creating the ERD, fixing bugs, hammering out the features of a music app and wrote the entire thing. A senior engineer would talk about that but also talk about scaling the music app for future purposes to handle future changes. To that end, he divided the app architecture into single responsibility features and delegated them to other people due to the complexity and negotiated with leadership for a timeline to do this correctly. On the surface, it may seem like the senior engineer just told everyone to do the work for him. But in actuality, there are so many little details and planning that needs to be done that it necessitates delegation. How should the music app communicate with the server? How does it look from one device to another? How does authentication work? Should there be some peppering in the audio stream in order to prevent piracy? How would decoding that look like? Should a UI layer be separated from the core logic and in what way? And most importantly, why would dividing the architecture here benefit us even? These are all questions that a junior engineer probably would not be able to answer or even think of. In fact, he would probably just say it works and it plays music. You would not want a person who says, I don't know how things work to be in charge of a team of engineers. And you would not want a person who is brilliant at scaling systems to fix bugs all day. Misleveling destroys code bases, organizations, and demoralizes developers. Being entrusted with that level of responsibility requires a good understanding of details and implementations. How can code be affected if we write things one way versus another? How can code be affected if we let business development steamroll the developers? We take the responsibility as a sign of that understanding and knowing all these dimensions and all these trade-offs is what makes a software engineer good. Your job in the interview is to show that you can actually think about these issues and you are competent enough to understand what your role is as an engineer. And based on those answers, we will judge your ability to take on responsibilities of certain levels. The more skilled you are, the more likely you will make the right choice and the more leverage you can be trusted with in order to make sure that the code heads in the right direction. So then what would our basic strategy be? One way to do this is that for every story you tell, 
there is a clear lesson that is tied directly to the engineering competencies and why you should be trusted with those levels of responsibility. Like I said before, disagreements, conflicts, and situations happen all the time. But this is why every question is fundamentally the same. Name a failure that you had, name a disagreement, and talk about a time when you had to take on more work than you were supposed to. Finally, always tie the story back to your values as an engineer and make sure those values are aligned with the impression that you want to give. Now, there may be many bumps in the road in that story and that's fine, every project has bumps in the road. But what you ultimately want to do is make it absolutely clear what the interviewer should take away from the situation. Do not ramble on and on and on about some project. Think about the hero's journey, where you have a start, some issues along the way, the struggles, the achievements, and most importantly, how you conducted yourself in a way that befits the level that you want to be at. Did you not get along with your coworkers for a project? Maybe talk about how you did not see eye to eye for the future of the code base and you resolved it by making the architecture flexible enough to accommodate for future plans. Your biggest weakness? Getting bored with new features that aren't challenging to implement because it means the code base you protect is clean. You know, small humble brag right there, but it doesn't have to be directly. It can be a bit roundabout, such as with team cohesion. But if you cannot eventually tie it back to the quality of your code, you are giving a bad answer. No company is going to value a guy who cannot think about the quality of the code or its future impact. At best, they're just going to be fixing bugs all day. So always try to eventually pivot to your core values after answering the question. This helps the interviewer make a case for you because he can actually understand the point of your five minute rambling. Help him make his life easier by spoon feeding him the story and the moral of it. So that was a lot, but in the next video, I'll go over some questions and a few responses at various engineering levels and how to improve at the behavioral interview. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure the next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.